Hello and welcome back to OA on Air, the official podcast of O'Neill & Associates. Thanks to everyone who tuned in and reached out to us about our first episode last week. We appreciate you taking the time to listen and now hope you'll take the time to subscribe so you can stay up to date on all of our offerings. It's been a busy week in Boston, a lot happening. We had the 2018 Bio International Convention. This conference brings global biotech and pharma leaders together with over 16,000 attendees from 74 countries. We also had the 86th annual U.S. Conference of Mayors in Boston this week, where mayors from all across the country come together to work on policy initiatives. The policies they adopt represent the collective views of mayors and are then provided to the president and to Congress. And it's Pride Week in Boston. O'Neill & Associates has been proud to work with Boston Pride for the last six years, so a lot of people in our office have been very busy this week. While the week is coming to a close, there's still a lot going on, and the big event still remaining is the parade on Saturday. The Pride Parade is one of the largest public parades in New England. 45,000 people participate, and we expect over 500,000 spectators. It starts at 12 o'clock on Saturday, June 9th, at the intersection of Boylston and Clarendon Streets in Copley Square. It's looking like we're going to have some good weather. If you're looking for something fun to do, you want to get out and show some support, head over to the parade. So that's some of the things happening in Boston this week. On our podcast this week, we have 3 2, one, go with Cosmo Macero, where he and I are talking about housing issues in Massachusetts, particularly as it relates to baby boomers, empty nesters, and retirees, and where they're going to live next. We're also discussing social media privacy and Apple's unfriending of Facebook. And the newly established city of Framingham is the most recent city to join what is being called a national movement to sue drug manufacturers and hold them accountable for their role in the opioid epidemic plaguing so many of our communities. This was also a big week for primary elections throughout the country with seven states holding primaries. I'll be speaking with David Peleologos, nationally recognized pollster, creator of the Bellwether Model, and director of the Suffolk University Political Research Center about his takeaways from this week's primaries, and he'll give us an OA on-air exclusive on some of his most recent findings. And finally, Two Minutes with Tom, where we speak with our CEO, Tom O'Neill. And this week, we'll focus on sports betting in Massachusetts. First up, three, two, one, go. Let's talk about something important. Hello, and welcome to a three, two, one, go on OA On Air, the official podcast series of O'Neill & Associates, New England's leader in public affairs. My name's Cosmo Macero, your host of 321GO, where each week we take a brief but purposeful look at three important stories for the universe of public affairs, business, government, investing, and the economy. In this installment of 321GO, we'll look at how empty nesters are facing a huge problem if they want to downsize to a downtown condo or other home. And Apple CEO Tim Cook basically declares war on Facebook how the new Apple OS features might change your social media experience. And finally, Framingham is one of the latest cities to join communities here in Massachusetts and elsewhere in the U.S. in suing drug makers for their role in creating the opioid crisis in America. Joining me here on 321GO is Kyan Isaacson, Senior Director at O'Neill & Associates, a state government expert, and, oh, by the way, the institutional voice of OA on air. Kyan, how are you? Well, you made me sound very fancy right there, so You are very fancy. I'm feeling good. Thank you for inviting me back again. Excellent. All right, then. Let's get to it. All right, up first, it's it's tough being an empty nester these days, especially if you're trying to downsize and move out of your home. Pretty standard uh, uh, evolution of life. You get to that age around uh, close to retirement age. You start thinking about, hey, you know what? The kids are out of the house We got this big home in the suburbs, south of Boston, north of Boston, west of Boston, wherever it may be, and we got a bunch of equity, and it's time to downsize, and and hey, let's move to a condo in the city. Guess what? Really tough. Mark Pothier, a a terrific journalist for the Boston Globe, did a piece just this past week for Boston Globe magazine, detailing his own plight, living on the South Shore, having a home with a lot of equity, and him and his wife wanting to and being ready to. To, to, to leave the nest, to, to, to downsize into that condo in the city and enjoy that lifestyle. Problem is, it, you can't downsize. In fact, it costs more to downsize than it does to upsize. You want to sell your home uh, these days, even though the pace of home values has really moved quickly 
it's not keeping up in about 15 to 25 miles outside the city of Boston. Uh, therefore, that big home you might have in, say, Kingston or Plymouth or uh, Watertown or even Belmont or wherever it may be, that, that may not get you into something much more than a, oh, I don't know, a five, five or 600 square foot walk-up Cayenne in the Back Bay or, or, or something in the North End. This kind of standard thing that people have been doing for generations is not really available right now because of the way housing prices have evolved, because of the out-of-control market in the city of Boston, even though, and we'll get to this later, even though the city of Boston is probably doing more than anyone else to address the housing crisis, um, it's a real issue. And, uh, and baby boomers are facing it right now. Those people who are in that you know, 55 to 58, 60 range looking to make that move into retirement. What do you think? Makes me happy that I'm not a baby boomer and I'm not dealing with trying to figure out how to downsize. But I think on the other hand, it's not all that easy being a millennial or a Gen Xer or any sort of young professional. A lot of people can't afford housing. That's in absolutely the suburbs true. Or the city. Um, this dynamic, though, is fascinating because I don't think this is a temporary issue. And, and by the way, Gen Xers, right, by the way, uh, you, you know, one day you're, 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 you're carefree and having a great time with your flannel and, you, and, and, and at the Nirvana concert. And guess what? You're 50, all right? You're, if you're like me, at the top end of Gen X, oh, I woke up and I'm 50, okay? I was at, I, I was at Soundgarden. Still now, at the Pearl Jam and, concert. And, and, and now I'm, but now I'm, I'm on the door of, I'm at the doorstep of thinking of, of, of retirement. It's kind of crazy, but when you get to that age, you start thinking about it. You've got people at the, at, the, at the other end of the baby boom, 55, 56, who are absolutely confronting this. Well, we're, we're just right behind them, and, 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 that's, and that's a problem. And um, it, it, it appears that the, the issue is a combination of the demand is really high for this certain type of lifestyle, the certain sort of urban lifestyle, um, uh, but, but there's not a lot of options in other communities around the city, and, and there's not enough housing being built elsewhere that gives people the lifestyle they want. They, they, they want to have that smaller scale experience. They want to have a smaller scale um, home, so they're not dealing with all the stuff that home ownership entails, but they want to have a life. They want to have nightlife. They want to have restaurants and shopping and access to transportation and things like that, and, and, and it's become a real problem. Well, it's funny. I mean, we talk about Boston's doing really well, and they're trying to make some strides. Um, you know, we work with the city of Framingham. They've done a lot, particularly around transit-oriented development, uh, to increase housing and, and presence. But one of the things is we're limiting ourselves because people want all these things. They want the lifestyle. They want access to nightlife. They want to be able to walk to the train station or to get into the city, what have you. You know, to take this in another direction, we've got a transportation problem in Massachusetts, and that. People only want to live for the vast, for a lot of you know in a certain area that still gives them access to the city, um, and that's that's another issue we have to grapple with. We can't just keep building more and more housing in the same. And, and there may not be a lot of solutions, but there may be some, and at least one. You mentioned transit-oriented development. People call that smart growth sometimes, or smart growth is a is a broader uh, a, a broader term for sort of the the right way or the better way to develop. And um, the reality is that communities in, in Massachusetts, there's only a handful across the whole state that are really doing work toward creating housing. I, I think there's about 10 or 12 municipalities statewide um, that are creating most of the new housing. And while on the one hand, you, you, you can't ignore the ridiculous cost of housing in the city of Boston. The city of Boston is doing more than just about any community in terms of creating housing stock. I think they're responsible for about 35, 37% of the state's new apartment construction in the city of Boston. So that's significant. Um, I think what's, what's important, the Massachusetts Smart Growth Alliance is absolutely dedicated to this. The Baker administration, through its housing choice incentives have been dedicated to this. The mayor of Boston has goals just for the city alone. Um, the community's got to play along. There's got to be zoning and um, uh, you know, planning in, in, in communities and suburbs and cities and towns around Massachusetts that are friendlier to the more 
strategically uh, uh, optimal types of development. Like you said, transit oriented, um, uh, multi-family, multi-unit residential, a little bit of density. People are petrified of density. I don't want the hundred new units in my neighborhood. No way. Who knows who's going to come into my community? They're going to, they're going to, you know, they're going to overrun the school system. Those are, those are issues that you have to contend with. But communities really need to pitch in and, and, and do their part and recognize that there's a shortage of housing, and and it's not just hurting the people that are are, are just getting started out. It's hurting everyone. It's hurting people at the at the other end of their, you know, on the on the back nine of their wonderful uh, uh, life experience as, as they approach retirement and think about, uh, you know, how they're going to spend their retirement years. They want to do it. They want to, they, 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 they want to have an exp uh, a good life experience. And the shortage of housing is really creating a problem in a lot of different ways. And now, this week in privacy news, Apple CEO Tim Cook has essentially declared war on Facebook, Cayenne, and the ACLU is fighting the war on our behalf, uh, I think, to protect us or to at least alert us that employers and schools uh, are maybe taking some drastic measures as they uh, review, you for, uh, review your candidacy for employment or enrollment and, and, and may want to use your your social media accounts in that way. Let's 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 start with that because that that took me by, by surprise that that an employer might say, "Hey, guess what? We're going to log into your Facebook account together, and you're going to walk me through it all." Okay, let's do that. So the ACLU currently has a bill, the Social Media Privacy Act, that they're pushing uh, on account of the idea that there are a number of employers and schools across the country who are increasingly requesting for access to people's private Facebook, Twitter, Instagram accounts, what have you. Um, not just, I'm going to Google you. Yeah, how and you access? So wait, how about they just look at your Facebook page and say, oh, wow, you, you posted stupid photos of you with a beer bong. Sorry. It, that's not enough? Now they want access? Now they want to log in under your name? Well, no, because too many of us have gotten smart enough as to how to restrict access to these things. So they want sort of unfettered access. So either the passwords to log in themselves, or they want you to log in in front of them while they snoop over your shoulder or then sit down at the computer and walk through. And that that's a little step too far. I, I, honestly, for that, I want a 401k match. I want three weeks vacation. I want flex time. I'll do it, but you know, I, I want something back if you're gonna be trolling my Facebook account under my own in, 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 with my own password. Interest. So you'd give it up if the if if the, if, if the get, benefits were there. I get, I get. If you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to worry about, sir. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Everyone's got something to hide. <laughs> Everyone's got something to. No, I don't think that I would. But uh, if, if the job was important enough, I'd want something in return. That's a. It, it's pretty rem remarkable. We're we're in the age of, of compromised privacy, and, and, and let's be honest. Americans, consumers, really the global community, people are, are e even though there's a lot of watchdogism going on here, and, and we'll get to Tim Cook in a moment, people are just giving it up, right? They're, they're just saying, hey, you know what? This is how I interact. I use social media. I post photos. I post photos of my family and my kids and myself. People know where I, I you know, I, there's, there's the Life360 and other types of apps where literally they're tracking devices. As long as you have your phone, you can be tracked by your family or by the way, anyone else who could hack the app. I'm sure that's really hard, not. So we've essentially compromised our own privacy by, by engaging in social media so, so enthusiastically. I think there's a little bit of a generational gap here on this, as we were discussing with our trusty producers here, Brooke and Ashley earlier, that as younger millennials especially have grown up in this age of digital and social media is just part of their life, I don't think they feel like they have any privacy left or that they even started with any. Yeah. Um, you know, our, our kids are growing up on social media, their picture, they have no say on uh, their baby pictures being out there and sort of, I think the mindset is different. They sort of given it up on, on, on protecting it. However, it does seem that they draw the line on giving an employer or a school direct access to poke around on yeah. their accounts, which, you know, the ACLU's uh, 
messaging around this is really that that should be on the same level of they can't go into your home and poke around and go through your stuff, um, which feels, uh, I feel, feel the same on that. I, yeah. I'm not giving anyone access to my social media accounts. I keep things private that I want to keep private. That's my business. We all have a, have a, have a private life. Uh, you can Google me yeah. and, you know, whatever pops up, pops up. Um, that's the world we have to live in now. The other level is not the direct taking over and snooping, so to speak, but the tracking of who you are, your likes for marketing purposes, and basically who you are as a consumer or a buyer. Yeah. Let's, let's get to Tim Cook and let's get to Apple. Their new operating systems are going are gonna to really change the experience uh, for, for social media users because they feel that, that Facebook uh, in particular is not doing its job. It's not doing its job to protect your data, to protect um, uh, the, the information that you want to be private, even though you're engaging in a very public platform that Facebook is. I think Apple is saying Facebook hasn't been responsible, so we're going to be responsible for them. I don't know how the chips are going to fall on that. Yeah. I'm, I think I like it. I think it's I funny. like the idea of someone tracking me less. No, I do too, but it's, it's, it's kind of like the um, sort of corporate nanny state meets the corporate anything goes, right? It's like face, Apple, we're going we're gonna to take care of you because Facebook is not and, and, and you're having trouble taking care of yourself when it comes to protecting your data and protecting your information. And we, ha we are having trouble taking care of ourselves because so many of us had no idea the level at which we were being tracked or our information was being gathered and how it was being used. Um, so I'm okay, again, I'm, I'm okay with that. I don't think that I, I'm among the large percentage of people that probably really didn't give a lot of thought to where all of my likes were going. Now I know. I don't want to like anything anymore. <laughs> I just don't like anything. I don't like anything. <laughs> exactly. You know, um, love to hear from some of our uh, listeners on this, but I know Facebook hates when you talk about Facebook on Facebook. So, hey, how about tweeting me <laughs> at Cosmo Macero on Twitter about Facebook? You can also email me at Cosmo at O'NeillAndAssoci.com. That's on privacy. That's on Facebook. <laughs> Finally, the city of Framingham, Massachusetts, is one of the latest communities to announce its intentions to sue companies involved in the opioid industry, drug manufacturers of prescription painkillers. Um, they're re really at the foundation of this national opioid crisis, Cayenne. The playbook on this is not new. Uh, it's effective and it's worked. The tobacco, the, the tobacco lawsuits began with this type of effort. And in this case, you've got communities in Massachusetts, I think Greenfield, Mass., out in Franklin County was one of the first or the first in Massachusetts to announce its intentions to sue the opioid industry, the prescription painkiller industry, the drug companies. Framingham has joined that. Uh, Chicago, Illinois, I think, is involved in this effort. Other communities nationwide. Um, this is a gathering legal storm uh, to, to hold drug makers accountable for a crisis, for an opioid crisis that is really tearing apart communities across the country. If by suing these drug companies they get money that's going to help these communities combat the opioid crisis, I'm wholeheartedly for it. Um, there's not enough resources to go around to do what actually really needs to be done to help people to prevent this from happening in the first place. Um, you know, Mary Von Spicer, first mayor of uh, the newly found city of Framingham, coming out really strong. I, I think that's great. And, you know, my feeling very simply is if these people are in any way, shape, or form responsible, which it would seem that, you know, in some ways they are, they deserve to be held accountable. If that means that they have to help pay for us to deal with it, then that's exactly what they should be doing. Yeah, you know, um, tell me if this sounds familiar. Uh, the law firm Scott & Scott, uh, which is working with uh, Mayor Spicer in Framingham and has, has worked in, in, on complex lit litigation like this uh, around the world, the intent is to try to prove the drug industry knew about the addictive nature of opioids, but recklessly promoted them in order to expand the market for their prescription drugs. Gee, sounds like the tobacco losses. Sounds a lot like that. Exactly. So like I said, the playbook exists. And in this case, um, you know, you know the, uh, 
the human devastation is in a different form, but it is really tearing apart communities. It's not just an urban problem. It's not just a problem that affects uh, low-income communities. It's not just a problem uh, where you would typically say, oh, you know, inner city, abs- inner city drug uh, uh, problem. Absolutely not. It is tearing apart families in the, in the suburbs. It, 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 it really, there, there's no sort of economic filter on the damage that's done um, uh, by prescription painkillers uh, and, and, and how they're abused. Again, not a legal expert. I don't know how this is going to pan out. I think that it's a, a bold move. It's an admirable move um, of you know Mayor Spicer, but of all the mayors that are that are looking to find a way around this. One of the things we can all agree upon, um, whether you're in uh, state government, city government, or, or just a citizen, is that we need more resources, and we don't have them. Um, if this is a way to get them, then I, I, I think, hey, let's let's give it a try. Well said. So cities and towns preparing for major litigation against the opioid industry. Uh, something we're going to be watching uh, very closely. We've got a couple of, uh, right now, in on the ground floor, the city of Framingham, the, the, uh, the city of Greenfield. All right, Cayenne. Hey, thanks very much. It was great talking with you again today. Always a pleasure. Terrific. That's going to do it for this week's edition of 321GO. 321GO is recorded in the OA On Air Studios, just off the historic Tip O'Neill Room, at our building in the heart of Government Center, Boston, Massachusetts. Thanks for listening. Goodbye till next time. I'm Cosmo Macero. I'm here with David Paleologos, nationally recognized pollster and creator of the Bellwether Model and director of the Suffolk University Political Research Center. And I just want to talk a little bit about everything that's been going on even this week. We had seven primary elections throughout the country. Uh, What are you seeing so far? Well, I think, you know, when we start with California, um, both parties kind of averted a disaster. So on the Democratic side, there was this panic that in the jungle primary scenario in California where the top two finishers uh, make it to the general election, regardless of party, there was this concern that two Republicans in some of the more conservative-leaning districts would dominate uh, the top two spots. None of that happened. So that was a, a sigh of relief for Democrats and Democratic voters in California and on the flip side, uh, the Republicans actually have someone at the top of the ticket, and that was not quite, you know, we weren't sure about that based on the polling. Um, and so you've got John Cox, who slipped into the number two spot with just over a million votes. Gavin Newsom, the Democrat, as expected by all of the polling, finished on top at 1.3 million. So what that means is that the Republican candidate potentially could draw in voters who would normally sit out a midterm election where Donald Trump wasn't on the ballot. Um, It remains to be seen whether or not that will energize Republicans or potentially could energize Democrats, too. So uh, California remains to be seen. That was really the first takeaway from the primaries. I think the second takeaway is that Women candidates really did well. Now, normally, uh, women in a Democratic primary, uh, a traditional Democratic primary, make up between 57 and 59 percent of the vote. We're currently modeling in Massachusetts 60 percent of the vote. Um, So it stands to reason, just by virtue of predisposed bias, we have so many more women in the Democratic primary coming up that... um, You've got nominees who are women in many different states, not just the the states that one one would think. You know, you had Kathleen Williams winning in Montana in that Democratic primary. You had a number of other women uh, uh, prevailing in New Mexico and so on. So you've got, uh, and in Iowa, you know, uh, uh, Cindy Axney, uh, was the nominee for the U.S. three seat. So I think that's that's a that's a positive for women who are underrepresented on both sides of the aisle. 
And um, the gender gap will close, though, in the general election. It won't be 57-43. It'll be more like 52-48. And so we'll see whether or not that, that gender advantage from the primaries carries through to the final elections. So the the biggest thing for anyone who may not know is that these elections are all so important because the Democrats are sort of on a on a journey, uh, we'll call it, to try and take back the House in the fall. Um, any thoughts on, I mean, you've been doing polls all throughout the country. How's it looking? Well, it's a, it's a good news, bad news story, really, um, party-wise. The good news for Democrats is on the House side. So the average pickup in a midterm election and, you know, in re- recent memory is 32 seats. We've had some years where it's been significantly higher. And really, uh, this year, that just an average midterm year would mean the House would come back to the Democrats. Um, Most estimates, my own estimates, Charlie Cook's estimates, uh, many of the other platforms, 538 and others, are looking at someplace between 20 and 30 seats, which would skew above uh, at or above the 23, which is what needs to happen on the Democratic side. So when I look at seats like the New Jersey seats, I mean, in my mind, those New Jersey seats, uh, I don't see a scenario where the Republicans win any of those. Um, I think California, a good amount uh, potentially are going to flip. I'm I'm not totally sure that it's going to be a sweep in California, because even in the, in the primary, um, a couple of Republicans, Steve Knight, uh, in uh, California, 25 got over 50 percent, as did uh, Mimi Walters in California, 45. So, you know, things look really good on the House side. And so for us in Massachusetts, that's a good news story for people who are uh, 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 congressional representatives who are high up in the Democratic echelon, like Mike Capuano, who has a primary this year, like uh Richard Neal, who probably would be the new Ways and Means chairman if the Democrats were to sweep. So um, th- there is a wave in on the House side. I'm uh, 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 less optimistic right now, today, on the Senate side. The Senate side, to me, um, looks a little bit more challenging. I think the Indiana seat, which is currently held by a Democrat, is going to be a tough one to keep, as is West Virginia. I'm not so sure about Montana, and I'm not sure about Florida. And here's the reason, uh, uh, beyond the polling. The people who were on the ballot for U.S. Senate this year were lost on the ballot six years ago. Six years ago, there was a presidential turnout. Presidential turnout means there were more young people voting and more minorities voting in states like uh, you know, Florida, Ohio, and, and other states. You need those younger and minority voters voting. In the midterm, now we've gone from 2012 to 2018. In the midterm, this time around, those senators don't have the benefit of Barack Obama being on the ballot, which was an added motivator. Instead, you're going to have less turnout, uh, and all statistical indicators are, are telling us that uh, you know, past historical voting patterns are, are suggest that midterm elections, even even with the issues and even with Donald Trump uh, on the ballot, I mean, I mean, not on the ballot as president, but being a polarizing figure, this is telling us that um, you need those extra votes if you're Cory Booker or, you know, if you're Bill Nelson in Florida, and they're not coming out because it's not a presidential election. So I think, uh, I'm not saying there's a red wave or a counter wave, necessarily in the Senate. But I think it's going to be really challenging to protect, number one, Indiana and West Virginia right off the top, uh, and then to be uh, retaining uh, states like uh, Florida and Ohio. Uh, Now, the good news for the Democrats is that Nevada looks really good, and so does Arizona. So, you know, even, you know, but even so, you know, the Democrats would have to win Nevada, Arizona, and protect um, advantages in West Virginia, Indiana, not to mention Montana, Ohio, and Florida. So, um, you know, it could be a lot of it could be a lot of a of a wash 
in the Senate, and currently, you know, Democrats are on the attack. So, you know, they need to win the seats, and they need to flip a couple of seats in order to take a majority. So we still have a long election season ahead of us. Uh, what races are coming up next, or, or are you paying close attention to in, in sort of the weeks and months ahead? So we, with Suffolk University, I mean, we're, we're very lucky, and we're, we're blessed to have two terrific media partners. Suffolk has the USA Today and the Gannett uh, media partners across the country uh, for national polling. And we also have the Boston Globe, uh, which I think is still or, or number six in the country in terms of subscriptions and so on. So uh, the Boston Globe is a terrific uh, partner for New Hampshire and Massachusetts and a lot of other polling we've been doing on issues like sexual harassment. So uh, and, and and given those partnerships, we are able to poll a lot more states than, than a lot of other colleges and universities. So what we've done for this year in 2018 is we're, we've decided to to poll states that have both governor's races and U.S. Senate races. Um, and so we can get a little bit of the yin and the yang in that we can get a couple of news bites at the apple on the federal level with questions about Trump and the U.S. Senate and Congress and the congressional race and at the state level for issue, more local issues uh, and the governor's race, potentially, or, uh, we may do uh, constitutional offices and even ballot questions that are relevant to drawing out specific voters in specific states. For example, Ohio, we just went in the field last night on an Ohio poll. We're partnered with uh, Cincinnati Inquirer for a release uh, early next week. And one of the questions, one of the issues, the hot issues is, is marijuana dispensaries, which are going to uh, go into effect in September. And so for that November election, we'll have an idea of how the first couple of months of, of um, you know, the, the, the implementation of marijuana for uh, medical reasons will, will work in Ohio and whether or not it'll be seen as a positive or a backlash. Now... I was fortunate uh, enough years ago uh, to be a student in one of your polling classes, and one of the things that I learned during that time was the, the poll results are one thing, but sort of some of the more interesting stuff happens when you dig down into the crosstabs. So is there any anything you've been seeing as you've been polling throughout the country that people might be surprised by or that you've been surprised by um, as takeaways? One of the factors we'll be watching is the relationship between intensity pro and con against uh, for and, and against Donald Trump and undecided in the ballot test. So you'll see in our polling analysis, just as a sort of an exclusive head up, heads up, that we will be doing an analysis on the relationship between Trump and not only the Senate candidates, but also the candidates for governor. Cross-tabulation is a terrific tool and you're absolutely right. Stra uh, Strategy-wise, it's it's the way a candidate moves from point A to point B. And a perfect example of that was that in the crosstabs in the last presidential election, we noticed that a significant amount of voters had negative opinions of both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, of both of them. And so when we looked at the crosstabs, and this helped uh, to, to explain to us tr Trump's win, um, in a lot of the states that he wasn't expected to win, when you looked at the cross of what we call the haters, we found that the intensity of hate and the distrust was higher against Hillary Clinton among the haters than Donald Trump, which meant we knew they were likely voters and we knew that they disliked both candidates. But that intensity level is something that we were able to measure through cross tabulation and helped explain um, how people eventually made and got to the end choice that they did. Um, and also, it was a, a great tool for us to figure out how third-party voters, and some states had both Jill Stein and Gary Johnson on, on their respective ballots, it gave us an indication of how those third-party voters would rotate if, you know, in the final days they were going to make a decision to jump off voting third-party and to get into the game of Democrat versus Republican. So, you know, keep your eyes on the analyses, not only in Suffolk's analyses, but uh, uh, analysis, but the analyses of other institutions of the juxtaposition of Trump 
favorability and job performance and the undecideds in the ballot test. One other thing I wanted to touch on was just issues. Um, I think from this week we've seen that healthcare uh, is still something people want to talk about and are, are concerned about as costs continue to rise and, and Medicare. Is that consistent with what you've seen and have you seen any other issues sort of taking the lead? Yes. You know, I write a column for, uh, for um, a USA Online and when we do our national poll release and I dedicated an entire column which basically suggested that it is a silver bullet issue for Democrats, and that is health care. And, you know, I would I would encourage your listeners to to find that article. They do a Google search on me and health care or USA Today and, and, and my and my name or Suffolk. You will find that analysis. It is the one issue that even independents trust Democrats with their families' health care. We even found a small portion of Republicans and conservatives who, when asked, who do you trust more with your family's health care decisions, um, uh, a, a significant amount were saying congressional Democrats. Now, you and I know how Congress has such an overall low rating among all voters, but that's a trust issue that Democrats can leverage if it's used properly. It's also a winning issue uh, as, as well as education um, for Democrats and, 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 and Democratic-leaning independents. Um, so keep an eye on that issue as, as we get closer. You know, those are winning issues of health care and education on, on the Democratic side. On the flip side, keep your eyes on the bull market and the stock market and the economy. Um, by, by most uh, most experts say that we're in either the second or the longest bull run in stock market history. And for sure, if we make it to November without a stock market correction or a crash, you're going to see Republicans, Donald Trump, I'm sure, and many other Republicans at the national level boasting about the fact that they were in office and they are presiding over an, an historical uh, um span of 10 years with uh, unprecedented economic growth, jobs, and a, a booming stock market. And, and there are a lot of people um, who have 401ks and, and are seeing you know their statements go up from month to month. That's going to benefit Republicans in ways that we are not seeing right now. Um, on the flip side, if there's a correction, or a significant uh, downturn, or even a crash, you're going to see a blue wave like you've never seen before. When 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 the crash happened in 2008, I was in the field with a poll. Uh, you know, at that, at that time it was John McCain versus Barack Obama, and we were in the field in Virginia, um, I believe, or North Carolina. I can't remember, but the the point is that overnight. When the stock market crashed, we saw white voters, which normally vote the Republican way, dead even with Barack Obama in a con very conservative state in some of the rural areas. And I couldn't believe how dramatic that overnight change. And it made sense. What was happening is you had people who were owners of stocks through 401ks who saw their wealth erased in one day or in a week in October of 2008, and they had to blame somebody. They were mad at Bush the president at the time, and they had to blame somebody. And so they took it out on John McCain, the Republican nominee. And so white voters, which are really the, the basis of Republicans and Republican wins, will turn on that Republican on a dime if they see their wealth evaporate. And because without white voters, you know, the Republicans you know, doomed. Uh, and so keep your eye on that. I'm not predicting a stock market correction or a crash, you know, um, but we've, 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 we've had a long run. I mean, we've had a long run without one and without even a serious correction. And what I'm saying is if that were to happen, you're going to see a wave like you've never seen before, because, you know, people, when it comes to their pocketbook, you know, if you have, you know, fifty thousand dollars in your four hundred one k one week, and then you have thirty five or forty thousand 
you know, the next week, someone's going to pay for that. And in, if that happens, you know, uh, Republicans are going to pay for it and ultimately Trump will pay for it. So a lot to look at uh, between issues and candidates uh, over the next few months. For a lot of people, they don't have the bandwidth to really take in all of this or want to take in all of it. What would you point people to? What races, what elections should they be keeping an eye on if they kind of want to keep their uh, a tab on what's happening? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And I, I mean, I could give a laundry list of states that, that we're looking at, as I say, that have the Senate and the governor's races. But I, I would say stay engaged with whatever websites that you follow. I would recommend 538, obviously. I would recommend coming back to the uh, 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 the OA website and the OA podcast because you're going to have other guests along the way that are going to be talking about this, but they will change. I mean, they will, they will be fluid. We saw it in California, certain congressional districts that were, you know, uh, they, that were panic time for Democrats in terms of being locked out were not. And there were others that just surfaced that ended up being very, very close that, that weren't expected from the polling. So, you know, um, I would keep generally, you know, it's a good thing to keep your eyes on states looking. Be, I know it's difficult to say now, but looking beyond 2018, that might be important to telling us what what we want to know in terms of the blue wall states and, and the Electoral College in 2020. So which is why we're pulling um, this cycle, Ohio and Florida and Nevada and Arizona and Pennsylvania. Uh, now we're pulling those now in 2018 because we have the benefit of knowing that they're going to be important states not only in 2020 and but also that they have Senate and governor's races. So those were the states that, that we'll be looking at, and uh, uh, we also may be pulling Wisconsin as well. So um, so keep an eye, I think, on on those states generally, and you'll see from the websites, you know, like 538 or. Uh, you know, Politico, Huffington Post, or, you know, there are a number of real clear politics, you know, where they've been terrific to us and to Suffolk. And, um, you know, they're going to have their hit list of 10 or 12. Uh, you know, Charlie Cook has his his list as well. And, and, and they will change over time. You know, certain seats are going to go from safe Democrat to toss up or vice versa. So, uh, you know, you, you, you want to keep you want to keep your eyes on the ball with with those states. But I mean, if I had to give you just a five second answer, I would say follow the states that have governors and Senate races this year, but also will be major states to watch in 2020. And those are states you'll be looking at as well. So we hope you will come back and chat with us again soon and keep us up to date. Of course. Happy to do it. Uh, David Paleologos, thank you very much. My pleasure. Have a great one. Thanks to David for joining us. With months left before general elections in the fall, be sure to stay tuned to OA On Air for more with pollster David Peleologos. And now, two minutes with Tom. So Tom, in our OA newsletter this month, you talk about the recent Supreme Court decision that allows states to legalize sports betting. In 1992, Congress passed the Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act, essentially banning individual states from legalizing sports wagering. But in early May, the prohibition was overturned by the Supreme Court. The Massachusetts legislature has been clear that this is an issue they're going to be taking up, most likely during the 2019-2020 session. So what does this mean for Massachusetts and the rest of the country? Well, nationally, it means that the court has now created a pathway, a legal pathway, for individual states to develop a sports betting regulatory system, uh, absent a single federal oversight law, which is really quite important. So the pathway is states working uh, to develop a regulatory system are going to have to find out exactly which way that system in their respective states is going to go. And every state, I imagine, is going to be different. Uh, if and how much you know, the tax licensees and individual bets are going to be. They're going to have to establish new or designated existing oversight agencies within their respective states to kind of figure out who, what, and where. Um, they're going to have uh, a need to enact uh, compliance and law enforcement standards that will go along with the gambling pursuit, the process of gambling in each state as well. Uh, they're going to have to determine which leagues or which games 
are going to be available to be betted on by the individual? And which facilities are, are you going to be able to go to in order to make a wager or, or a bet on, on your sports betting? So the entirety should take a, a period of time, if not years, in the respective state. The only state I know about at, to this point in time is the state of New Jersey, which apparently has already thought about this, passed the legislation, and is up and ready to go, I think, following this past Memorial Day. So you'll be hearing and reading more about that as we go along. Here in the state of Massachusetts, our state legislature will probably be taking it up, not this year, but next in the next legislative session, which means sports gambling in Massachusetts is probably a year, if not two, away, number one. Number two, I would, I would urge people looking to get involved in, uh, in sports wagering in Massachusetts to do it almost immediately because there's a lot to be sold to our individual legislators and to the administration uh, in the state of Massachusetts. So there's a lot of work to do. So the casino industry uh, in Massachusetts obviously took a, took a long time to get here as well. Uh, the Commonwealth and, and state officials were very deliberate about the process. Yes. Um, but we've seen a little bit of a fallout in that in the last few months. So are there any lessons learned as we move forward on, on sports wagering? I think, I think the most important lesson learned is that, the, is that the gambling commission here in the state of Massachusetts is not to be fooled around with or minced with, to be very honest with you. When they see something wrong in the industry, they're going to confront that wrong. They're going to ask questions about it. There'll be some investigative work which will be done, and then a report will be issued and a decision made by vote, as is, as is the case with the Wynn Casino. All right. Well, stay tuned, everybody. OA On Air is developed, recorded, and produced in our Boston office here in Government Center. Production by Brooke O'Meara Sion. And content creation by the O'Neill & Associates team. Music is provided by Ben Sound and Long Zijun. To stay up to date with us here at OA On Air, be sure to subscribe on SoundCloud and iTunes.